Um, sorry to, for that hold up. Anyway, I just want to firstly say a very, very warm welcome to Rev. Yeshua Grinstein, who is one of my old teachers from um, back in my time in Eretz Israel, who um, taught me when I was in the uh, Amiel training program for Shlichim from Israel. We're going to Chutzlaretz. And um, not only were, was Rabbi Yeshua a teacher of mine, but also was an advisor about uh, you know, somebody with a lot of experience in um, <clears throat> the field of um, you know, delivering high quality Judaism to people um, in the diaspora and uh, the Torah that um, we learn in Eretz Israel also to people outside of Israel. And um, <clears throat> still uh, somebody I look up to very much. So also, aside from my, uh, my personal relationship with uh, Rev. Grinstein, Rev. Grinstein is currently the, correct me if I'm wrong, the Director of Development uh, for Tsohar in North America. Um, he's got smicha from the Rabbanut of Israel and uh, BA in Education from Herzog College, which is also where I, where I studied. And uh, he's got author of numerous books, um, in, including the, um, the Musings of a Minyana, which is a very, very important uh, book for our times. And also he was the rabbi of the uh, Bet Israel Synagogue in Halifax, Canada. And, and um, where I met him, the director of training and placement for the Strauss Amiel Institute of Or Torah Stone. So um, it's got lots more um, to his uh, resume than that, um, but I'll, I think I'll leave it there and hand over the floor to you, Rav Yeshua. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much, Rabbi Rosenberg and uh, Rebbitz and Liddy. It's uh, really a pleasure to see you both, at least to see you both. Hopefully I'll be able to uh, properly give you a hug uh, when I see you in person, hopefully sooner than later. It's been a long while since COVID hit us all and uh, at least we could see each other this way. It's really a pleasure to be with everyone at the Mayan and uh, to share with you uh, a topic that uh, I have to say, I'm not happy to be associated with. I would uh, much rather that if they say my name, I'd be associated with Purim. But uh, for some reason or another, destiny is have it that when they say my name, they say keynote and Tishabov. And uh, the reason is that for the last 12 years, this will be the 13th year, I've been leading an all morning service of keynote in which I try to explain the keynote in light of what we're going through. And that's exactly what I'd like to share with you this evening, namely how to explain keynote to ourselves in the year 2022. So before we do that, if I may, let's just take one little step back right at the beginning of the keynote of the morning. The first keynote, the first lamentation that we say, starting with the words Shabbat Tzurumeni, there's a term that's on the top of the source sheet in front of you that says, ben My eyes are waiting for the prophecy of Zechariah, the son of Berchia, to come true. The prophecy is on the right side of the source sheet. And that is that this fast day will turn into a holiday. We have a prophecy that all the fast days will turn into proper holidays and we won't be fasting, but we actually will be feasting. My question is, why is it that we have to wait for it? I mean, it would be wonderful if the picture you see in back of me will come true. Namely, that people will daven at the Kotel and right on top of the Wailing Wall, you'll see the temple, the Beit HaMikdash. I hope that picture comes true sooner than later. However, it's not like at this moment, Monday, August 1st, I feel like I woke up this morning and the first thing I said was, I don't have a base of Migdash. And the question is, why is it that we have to mourn for something that we never had? Meaning the people sinned during the first and second temple, I decided to destroy it, but what does that have to do with me? And therefore, I believe this is a good way to begin the keynote every year, but especially this year, I believe I have a new insight into it. If you look on the left side of the source sheet, you'll see that the Jerusalem Talmud says the following words. I always thought it said the following, that 
any generation in which the temple is not built, it is as if it's been, it is continued to be destroyed. But that's not what the Talmud says. And I quote, Kol dor any generation in which the temple was not rebuilt, namely, the picture to my left in the back of me didn't come true. Ma'alina love, it is as if ki'ilu hu hechrivo. It is as if he himself destroyed it. Namely, there's a temple somewhere, and we all destroyed it again this year. Now, what does that mean? I never saw a temple. I saw alleged pictures like the one in back of me, but a temple I never saw. So if I never saw it, how exactly did I destroy it? I can take this cup and totally destroy it by, you know, smashing it. But due respect, I never saw a temple. So how exactly did I destroy something that I never had? Explains the Khatam so fair, you see his words, but I'll say it outside. He says every single year, we go through the same experience that they went through then. The experience started on the fast of Asara Betevet, that for people in my part of the world is the shortest fast, and I, just, and I understand that for people in your side of the world is the longest fast. Asara Betevet was the day in which the process started. Nebuchadnezzar decided to lay a siege on the city of Jerusalem for three years. They starved them to death. They had no supplies. And eventually, three years later, on Shivasar Tammuz or the ninth of Tammuz, Machlok at Bavli Yerushalmi, they went into the old city. It took three weeks. And that's why this is called the three weeks. And eventually, on Tishabav, the temple was destroyed, like the picture on my right. Says the Chatham Sofer, every single year. On Asara B'tevet, in heaven, God decides if we're going to go through that again this year, or the temple's going to be rebuilt. And if we go through it again, namely if Asara B'tevet, we wake up in the morning and we have to fast the entire day, that means that once again we destroyed a potential temple that was ready to be given to us. Now that's a very, what I call, homiletic interpretation, namely, if Rabbi Rosenberg and Liddy would say that in the training program that he just mentioned, I'd probably say, Rabbi Rosenberg, you have a very wild imagination. However, he's not totally off. What do I mean? The Rambam, when he talks about this particular fast day coming up, says the following words, the second, the third source on the page on the left side. Yesham yamim Yisrael there are fast days every single year. And one of them is Tisha B'av. And what does he say about this day? The day is there not just to fast and to be sad, but rather to open one's heart and to repent. Why do you have to repent? What did I do wrong? Says the Rambam. These days will be a reminder to our evil deeds. O ma'asei avoteinu and those of our forebears, shahaya kemaaseinu ata, which is like what we're doing today. Says the Rambam in a very nice way, what the Chatham Sofer, I believe, is saying. Namely, that if there's no temple this year, it's not their fault. Don't learn history. It's my fault. Namely, I have to repent, because right now there's something wrong that's preventing these days from turning into holidays. And therefore, right at the beginning of the keynote, literally the second passage, we say the words, my eyes are looking forward to the prophecy that these days will become holidays. Because if not, it's not that today is Tisha B'Av, I have to go through a history lesson of what happened then, but it has nothing to do with me. But rather, right now, there's something wrong with us, and we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. And we have to repent because, as the Rambam says, our evil deeds, that it's like what they did. And therefore, every Tisha B'av, we Ashkenazi communities do something rather strange. In the morning, we don't wear tefillin or talis. And in the afternoon, we do. And we, in addition to that, also say the words in one of the blessings of the silent Amidah for Mincha, we say, Nachem Hashem Elokeinu, 
et avilei Zion ve et avilei Yerushalayim, that God should comfort those who are mourning Jerusalem today. Says the Ritva, brought by the Beit Yosef. The Ritva was one of the great medieval scholars brought by the codifier of Jewish law, that the reason for this is that during Mairiv and Shachrit on Tisha B'Av, it's like a loved one that hasn't yet been buried. And when a loved one hasn't yet been buried, we don't wear tefillin. In other words, there is a destruction, not then, this year. This year, something has been there, has been destroyed, and we have to fill it in, and we have to repent for it because it's been destroyed. So ultimately, according to this, when I approach the keynote, I never go through a history lesson. I use history from time to time, but all my keynote presentations have been the current events this year and what can be fixed and what can't. When people ask me, what's my keynote program about? Then I say the following. I don't believe that I would teach Rabbi Rosenberg and Liddy to say this when they're trying to get into a community but because I'm a bit past that in my age and I have barely enough hair to boast, like your rabbi, I say the following. I say, I'm gonna let off steam once a year publicly. You're welcome to listen. And I let off steam about what's happening this year, not what happened then, but what happened this year, because there's something wrong this year that's preventing us from having these days as days of feasts and as days of holidays. And the sources prove it. And that's what I try to do in the keynote. So with that presentation and that introduction, let's go through some of the examples to prove what I'm talking about. As we go down, allow me to begin with the first example. Throughout the keynote, again and again, we find that whoever authored them says not only are the Jewish people crying and not only is God crying, but the Torah is in ashes. The Torah is something wrong with it. Now, I hate to break it to everyone, but as far as I see, there's more Torah learning today than there's been in generations. Let's just take your community. I've been had the pleasure of being in Melbourne many times, and I don't recall that you have a lack of Torah learning in your community. Baruch Hashem, you have a wonderful rabbi in Rebetzin. If for some forsaken reason you don't like them, then you can always go to other rabbis and Rebetzins. And therefore, there's a lot of Torah learning happening. Now, if you don't say Melbourne's amazing, let's go to other communities, if I may. There's a community in Israel that has more yeshivas and Torah learning than ever before, both for men and for women. So why is it that throughout the keynote, it seems like the Torah is crying? Two examples are right here. In the keynote, starting with the words, it says, the five books of Moses are crying. In the keynote, talking about those that were killed in the Crusades, it says, Torah, Torah, the Torah should wear ashes. Now, what's missing with Torah right now? I'm pretty sure in your community, like every community, there's going to be a pamphlet or pamphlets about all the laws of Tisha B'Av that come out on Shabbos and goes into Motzei Shabbos and to Sunday and what do you do and what don't you do and how do you do it? What exactly is lacking in our Torah today? And allow me to buttress the question because when I prepare the keynote, I always look at the contemporary scene. And the best way to look at the contemporary scene is to go to the code of Jewish law and to see what the Jews are supposed to be doing every day. So the code of Jewish law says, and I quote, Yesh mi she'omer, thankfully, we don't pass in this way, she'gazru she'yumitanin kol sheni v'chamishi, that you should fast every single Monday and Thursday on what? Al chorban habayit, on the destruction of the temple, ve'al ha'torah she'nisrefa, and on the Torah that has been burnt. Now, Chorban Habayit, the destruction of the temple, I understand happened. It's not built yet. But what Torah was burnt? The very fact that I'm learning the code of Jewish law means the Torah hasn't been built. And this is buttressed by the fact that the Gura says that in the Eicha, 
when we read the words, Malka v'sareya bagoyim ain't Torah, that all the leaders were amongst the non-Jews and there's no Torah, says the Gra, ain't Torah below Beit Mikdash. There's no Torah without a temple. Now, what do they mean? Throughout Jewish history, every single time there was a destruction, the Torah went up, not down. We have the Babylonian Talmud, the Jerusalem Talmud, all these things happened after the destruction. So what does this mean? That the Torah is not complete. I understand we have no temple, but what does it mean we don't have a Torah? I'd like to explain it based on something that happened here in Israel during COVID. I know you experienced it in Melbourne, but because I don't live in Melbourne, I don't name names about what happens in Melbourne. If I have to say something, I'll say it about Israel because here's where I pay my taxes. You can complain about Melbourne because that's where you pay your taxes. During COVID, when the government decided for better or for worse to close down schools and shuls and whatnot, there was a segment of the Hasidic community that decided they're not gonna listen. And after Shabbos at a tish of the Rebbe, the Rebbe came out publicly and said that tomorrow morning we're opening up all our institutions. And if they have any issues, if the police come, don't curse, don't shove, don't call them Nazis, send them to me. He gives his address, I'll take care of it. Rabbi Tamir Granot, who was a Rosh Yeshiva in Tel Aviv of a Hester Yeshiva, both Rabbi Rosenberg and I learned in what's called the Hesda Yeshiva that combines Torah learning with army service. So one of them is called Orot Shaul, and he's one of the Rosh Yeshivas. He decided to take this statement of Rabbi, of this Rebbe, and analyze it. And this is what he said. And it's in the words of Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky here on the page. Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky, great, great Lithuanian Gadol by Yisrael, great Jewish leader who died in 1986, I still remember his death. He said, based on the words of the Maharsha, that ever since the temple was destroyed, we referred to God as our father in heaven, but not as our king. And he explains why. And I quote, when there was a temple, life was not limited to religious services. Namely, when you said the word Torah, it wasn't only synonymous with Shabbat and kosher food and when to fast and when to feast and what blessing you say before you eat and what blessing you say after you eat. In other words, there was much more to Torah than just my personal religious behavior. But what happened? We went out to exile. And since we went out to exile, the Torah went out to exile. And instead of the Torah being the pamphlet to make the world a better place, it became a little tiny pamphlet for my home, for my place of work, maybe for my Jewish community and only my Jewish community, and not much more. In other words, if you ask a Hasidic Jew of that sect, what is Judaism to you? What is God to you? What is Torah to you? The answer will be, it's Shabbos and it's Yontif and it's kosher food and it's family purity and it's blessings before and after you eat. And there are other things that are important, but that's the basics. Ever since we went out to exile, that's been the Torah, the code of religious personal behavior. Personally for me, if you have many Jews like me, you got yourself a minion, so you have a community like me, but nothing to do with the public thoroughfare. And yet, when you look at the Torah, the way it's supposed to be, the Torah has a lot to say about security, fighting wars morally, running a state, running a country, public health. We don't deal with that. When we say the word Torah, it always means one thing, little religious behavior for an individual. And therefore, says Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky, why is it on Yontiv that when we daven, we always say, God, reveal for us the honor of your kingship, says Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky, because right now God is my father, a personal relationship in my home with a father. My king? 
Who is he a king over? He's a king over a few Jewish individuals, and that's it. And therefore, during COVID, many Hasidic groups in Israel, and not just Hasidic groups, came along and said, in the name of the Torah, we're not listening to the health directives, because the health directives deal with the state. They deal with a global national need. The Torah that we have is individual in our individual little place. What we do shouldn't bother anyone. And that's a tragedy. That's a tragedy for which the Code of Jewish Law says to fast every Monday and Thursday. That's a tragedy in which we read in Eicha, Malka v'sarea bagoyim, ein Torah. When the Torah is amongst, in the exile amongst kings and queens that are not Jewish, then there's no Torah. The Torah is very limited to individual behavior. And therefore, throughout the year, I looked for many, many examples this year, and unfortunately, I have too many examples, in which people basically said, what I do doesn't matter. You know, it says to save energy because there's an energy crisis. Well, you know the old joke. I say, is the person across the street saving energy? Yes. What about the person on the other side of my, my house? Yes, he's saving energy as well. Okay, so if he's doing it and he's doing it, what I do doesn't matter. So I can put on my air conditioner. That's exactly what we mourn for on Tisha B'Av. And that's why throughout the keynote, it says the Torah is in mourning because the Torah is very limited today. Not just limited in terms of the laws of sacrifices and purity and impurity that we don't do today without a temple, but rather limited in the scope of influence. Example number one on the contemporary scene, taking examples of religious Jews that during COVID ignored health directives because they believe that their Torah has nothing to do with the global and public thoroughfare. Number two, another kina that we read on Tisha B'Av talks about, unfortunately, women and men eating their own children because they were starving to death during the time of the temple. It's a gruesome and terrible kina if you know Hebrew, it's really difficult to read. Very difficult to read. I want to deal with the end of it. At the end of it, the person that authored it said, modi'im. What happened to them, they talk about. But what they did, they don't talk about. Now, what does this mean? I can give endless examples. Let's start at the basics. We as Jews love to talk about what non-terrible, non-Jews, anti-Semites do to us. And there's no lack of examples even this year, unfortunately. How many of us, however, have spoken about what we've done and the lack of responsibility we take? And I'm going to give you one example amongst many. The Gemara and Gitin, unfortunately, that we're allowed to learn on Tisha B'Av, talks about a terrible incident that happened at the destruction of the temple. A prophet named Zechariah, who admonished the people, told them to rectify their ways. The people didn't like it, and they killed him. They didn't just kill him, they murdered him in the temple. They didn't just murder him in the temple, they murdered him in the temple on Yom Kippur, which according to some was on Shabbos. Now, this is awful. First of all, a Jew killing a Jew. Second of all, in the temple. Third of all, on Yom Kippur. Fourth of all, on Shabbos. This is where the famous joke comes from, that if a Jew really wants to sin, then he eats a ham sandwich on Yom Kippur that came out on Shabbos. So the Gemara says that this is what happened. Nevuzadran, who was the chief of staff of the army that captured Jerusalem, came into Jerusalem, and a miracle happened. He comes into the temple, and it seems like there's blood bubbling up from the floor. He asks the locals, what is this? And they tell him, it's probably from the sacrifice. That's what we call, they double-talked him. Well, he sees that the blood continues to bubble. So he says, you better tell me, or I'm going to kill you. So they told him there was once a prophet named Zechariah, and he admonished us, and we didn't like what he was going to say. So... Today, in the year 2022, we win elections. If we don't like the leader, then we just murdered the guy. 
So Nevuzadran said, okay, if the blood is bubbling, that means God says you didn't atone for this sin. So I'll tell you what, I'll kill you. I won't just kill you. I'll kill hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of Jews that were responsible for his death. And nothing helps. He kills and kills and kills and the blood still boils. Finally, finally, he says, Zecharia, Zecharia, Zecharia. I killed almost all the good Jews. You want me to kill them all? At that moment, the blood stopped boiling and the floor was clean. And then the Gemara says, by he shot the, at that moment, he started to repent. This guy, this Nazi from our perspective that killed hundreds of thousands of Jews started to have tshuva, started to have remorse. And according to the end of this Gemara, and I quote, he became a Gerat Tzedek, he became a proper convert. Now, I take this story and I ask a very simple question. We had a tragedy this year in Israel, just a year ago. It's called the Meron tragedy. I'm pretty sure you read about it or you heard about it. 45 people were crushed to death because of negligence in the Meron burial place of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. 45 people were killed. So obviously this caused quite the stir and rightfully so. And there's a a commission of inquiry. Recently in the commission of inquiry, three leaders of the time testified. The prime minister at the time, the minister who was in charge of the event, and the police chief who was in charge at that time of the event. Not the chief of police, the person that was involved in that particular place in Israel. And this is what happened. The prime minister said, I never knew there was a problem there. No one ever told me. And when they asked him, but letters were sent to the prime minister's office, his answer was, the letters never reached me. And he walked out of there not thinking twice. The minister in charge said, and I quote, taking responsibility doesn't mean I'm guilty, and walked away. The chief of police of that event at the time said, I'm responsible, and I quit, and I'm resigning. Now, I take this event, and I ask, who is the closest to what the Torah talks about when it comes to responsibility. Just this week, two days ago, we read the Parsha of Masse. Finally, you people outside of Israel caught up to the laning in Israel. It has been a 14 week nightmare for people like me who have traveled back and forth. I read Parshas twice and I miss Parshas, but thank God we're on the same page finally. I don't know why this happens every time it happens, but it happened. Well, this week we all read the same Parsha. And the end of Parsha Masay, we talk about the cities of refuge that you go to if you killed someone inadvertently. Well, in one of these cities of refuge, if indeed you killed someone by mistake and you're there, you're released when the Kohen Gadol, the Grand Kohen, dies, explains Rashi. At the very least, the Kohen Gadol is a bit at fault because he didn't dive into God that such an event should not happen. Namely, that there won't be negligence when it comes to someone, say, chopping down a tree with an ax, when people are on the road driving. Whatever the issue might be, there shouldn't be a situation in which negligence happens and people get killed. And I ask you, is this what we're seeing from our leadership today? When they come into a commission of inquiry and they take absolutely no responsibility by saying, I never saw the paper. I didn't know there was an issue. I uh, am responsible, but not responsible. What a far cry it is from what we see by this arch enemy of Israel named Nebuz Zadran, who goes ahead and says, if I kill all these Jews, And finally, Zechariah's blood stopped boiling because I said, you want me to kill them all? 
that I'm going to become a convert. He took a bit of responsibility. I don't see our leaders doing the same when such a tragedy happens. So just to sum up what we've done until now, we started out by saying that keynote have to do with us, not just what happened then, but what have to do with us. And I showed two examples. The first example was the fact that the Torah is limited only to religious behavior of the individual today, nothing to do with the public thoroughfare, and that's a tragedy. And number two, our leaders are not taking responsibility over events that they really should take responsibility. So therefore they talk about what the non-Jews, the terrible anti-Semites do to us, but they don't take too much responsibility on what they themselves could have prevented. Let's go on to another example with your permission. In one of the keynote, we say to God, we're at fault. Lecha Hashem At a funeral, I'm pretty sure, Rabbi, you uh, of course correct me. Do you say Hatsur Tamim Po'alo at a funeral? Siduk Hadin, saying God, we, uh, we don't understand your ways, but we accept your judgment. Well, we do that in the keynote too. And I always use it as, I would say, an opening to talk about an issue that really bothers me, not within some other community, but within our community. And I'll tell you what this year, I believe, is the biggest challenge to our community here in Israel. There is a beautiful verse in the book of Kohelet that we read on Sukkot. At the very moment or at the very place they conduct justice, that's where evil happens. The Midrash says that that means that at the very place, the Sanhedrin, which was right next to the temple, the place where the grand rabbi sat and decided laws for us all, right next to the temple, that's where they killed Zechariah that I just mentioned. Well, this year, we didn't kill any Zechariah, but I have to admit, you can kill people with a sword and with a gun. You can also kill people with words. And I don't have to begin to tell you how dangerous words are. Well, one of these words were said this year, and they're said against rabbis. There's a group of rabbis that have come together. And when a rabbi says something, that doesn't exactly sit well with them, they don't just attack, they belittle. They don't just belittle, they curse. They basically don't say we have a debate, which rabbis had throughout the generations, but rather they come along and they say, this rabbi is really not a rabbi. And what he says is really not true. And even though he has sources, he's taken all the sources and took them out of context. And there's no debate. And this is a far cry from where we should be. The Gemara says in three different places, at the end of Trachtet Yevamot, Nazir and Kritut, Talmidei Chachamim Marbim Shalom Ba'olam. The Torah sages, many people quote and translate, expose peace in the world. Rabbi Shaul Lieberman said that's the best joke I've ever seen. Rabbis have peace. They always fight with each other. One rabbi says it's permitted. The other rabbi says it's prohibited. Where did you ever see rabbis agree with each other and bring peace? I don't believe it means peace. Shalom means from the word shalem, wholeness. When you see a few rabbis that say yay and a few rabbis that say nay, then you got a full picture. When everyone agrees with each other and no one disagrees with one another, and if someone disagrees, they belittle him and there's no healthy debate or conversation, that's not peace, but it's also not fullness because all I'm hearing is one point of view. I take this this year because there's a rabbi in Israel, you may have heard the name, Rabbi Malamed, who is a huge Talmud Chacham, wrote endless books on halacha, and he's being belittled because certain rabbis don't agree with what he has to say. And one of the things they say against him is the fact that he's very lenient on certain issues. Well, like any good rabbi, he's lenient on certain issues and he's stringent on other issues. And this is where I say, we have a lot to fix. We have a lot 
to do. Why? Because the Gemara says in Mesechet Makot, Amar Rabba says Rabba, Kama Tipshe Shar Inshe, in the box on the source sheet. How silly are people? Why? De Kaime Mekame Sefer Torah. When a Sefer Torah is taken out of the ark, they stand up out of respect. But they don't get up. They don't stand up when a great rabbi walks by. And what is a great rabbi? This is the example of the Gemara, that when you do a cardinal crime, you get punished 40 times. And the rabbi said it doesn't really mean 40. It means 39. Explained the ostrich of Rebbe, and I have it here in the original, that the definition of a rabbi is to make life a bit easier for a Jew. That's what a rabbi does. So if it says 40, it's really 39. Indeed, Rashi says on the Gemara at the beginning of Trachte Beitza, Tov lanu koach matir. It's more important to tell us who's lenient because he's not fearful to allow something. But those that say everything's forbidden, it's no proof for anything. Anyone can say everything's forbidden. You know, it's much easier to say, don't use the computer, don't watch TV, definitely no internet. Everything is a 100% tame impure. It's much harder to say, Yes, use it, but use a little, use a little common sense as to how to use it, when to use it, what to use, etc. So says the ostrich of a Rebbe, as well as Rashi, the definition of a rabbi is not to make life harder for people. That's easy. It's to make life easier for people. We have a beautiful Mishnah, a beautiful Mishnah in Mesechet Mido talking about the temple that says that when someone was put in excommunication in Cherem, he would come to the temple and they would say to him the following words, God who dwells in this house, should put into your heart that you should be able to listen to what the Jewish people say and rectify your ways. Meaning even someone that was excommunicated came to the temple for solace. And yet today in Israel, we have a certain politician that came out and said the people from the other party should not be welcome in shul. We have rabbis that say about other rabbis that there were really reformed Jews. You know, Orthodox rabbis that wrote books, that have students, that teach Torah, very easily quoted as saying there are really reformed Jews, they're not real Jews. Quote, and that's the saddest thing I've ever seen, because every single time, every time a rabbi attacks another rabbi in that vicious way, we lose another Jew. I'm privileged to work in the Tzohar organization. Our definition, our job description is to bring Judaism to a non-affiliated and secular Jews. Every single time a rabbi speaks against another rabbi, we lose another one. And that, I believe, is another thing we mourn for. And there's no lack of examples, unfortunately, this year for that as well. And finally, last but not least, and then I'd love to hear what you have to say in your questions. We have a kina that starts with the words, Al-Khurban Beit HaMikdash, Asher Hu Kihuras Bechihudash, on the destruction of the temple that has been destroyed. Does anyone have a problem with the wording here? If I would write it, I would say, Al Beit HaMikdash, on the temple that was destroyed. It seems like it says, not on the temple that was destroyed, but rather on the destruction that has been destroyed. What does that mean? The destruction was destroyed? Explains Rabbi Yecheskel of Ramsky, one of the great Dayanim out of England that eventually made Aliyah to Israel. Once upon a world, people really felt Tisha B'Av, for various reasons, either because they lived the destruction of the temple or they're living in a situation in which things are terrible, 
Whatever the reasons were, when Tisha B'Av came, it was a really, it was a real day. And I have descriptions of this, even from 100 years ago. But today, thank God, because of our affluence and because of the postmodern world we live in, things are not so bad. So not only has the temple been destroyed, the mourning for the temple has also been destroyed. Because quite frankly, people don't feel it. Quite frankly, people don't feel that something's missing. And indeed, I feel this every single year when I hear people talk about Jerusalem and they talk about the Temple Mount. We have a leader in Israel that said publicly this year that the Jewish people have no claim to the Temple Mount. The Kotel is the most important place for the Jewish people. We have another head of a party in Israel who said on a radio interview, and I have it all, and I quote, it's in Hebrew, I would let you listen, but I'll just uh, translate it, that she believes that Jews should have a right to pray on Har Abayit when we make a peace agreement. So they asked her, the anchor on the radio, but what do you mean make a peace agreement? It belongs to the Jewish people today. The Temple Mount belongs to the Jewish people. You can, of course, debate, should you go up there or not? You can debate if it's wise politically, but what do you mean when we get a right from our whoever we're making peace with? And she basically said the Temple Mount doesn't belong to us. So not only has the temple been destroyed, the destruction has been destroyed. There's two leaders of the Jewish people that don't believe the Temple Mount, that's called the Temple Mount, have anything to do with the Jewish people. And I end with this because there used to be a custom written in the Gemara and Mesechet Sofrim that before you read either Eicha on the night of Tisha B'Av or the Torah reading in the morning of Tisha B'Av, you used to say the bracha Dayana Emet that we usually say at a funeral or on any bad news that we hear. Today, the Ramah on the bottom of the page says, this is not our custom anymore. We don't make this blessing anymore on Tisha B'Av. We're so far removed from those events that not only do we not have a temple, even the destruction of the temple has been destroyed. We're so far removed from it that to say it's bad news for us, it's not bad news for us. It's on our calendar every year. Comes July, August. And we have to have three weeks and nine days and Tish above and two fast days in between during those three weeks. You know, we're used to it. It happens. You know, I couldn't iron my shirt this morning. OK, so everyone knows what you do when you don't iron your shirt. Right. For those that travel, I'm sure you all know if you can't iron your shirt, you bring it into the shower with you. And then the. All the uh, smoke that comes out of the hot shower eventually makes your shirt ironed in some magical way. So, you know, it's on my schedule. I forgot to iron a shirt. I brought it into the shower. It's okay. I get used to it. So Tisha B'Av's on the calendar. Well, everyone will get ready for the fast in the way they usually do, and we'll get through it, and we said we did it. This is a tragedy. Once upon a time, Jews felt how much we're missing. And I end with this because I believe this is my challenge every year. As I said, for the last 12 years, I've been doing an all morning Tisha B'Av program, and this is my 13th year. All I try to do is to ask a very simple question. How is this real for us now? Looking at history books is important, but that's not what I believe Tisha B'Av is about. And I brought you four examples of what I believe is the destruction this year. My first example is the Torah has been so limited to religious behavior and has no influence on the public thoroughfare. My second example was the fact that leaders don't take responsibility for things that go wrong. And even negligence is part of that. Number three, the fact that rabbis fight with each other in such a vicious way, the rhetoric is unbelievable. And number four, and last but not least, even the temple has been destroyed because we no longer feel the mourning and the sadness that we used to. And I hope for the sake of us all that until indeed the picture in the back of me becomes a reality, we'll be able to make Tisha B'Av into a real day. But the only way we do that 
is if we do two things. Number one, we look at the keynote seriously. Number two, we look at reality seriously and we try to put them together and ask, what can be fixed this year? What's out of our control and can't be fixed? Many a times they ask me in my many various travels, what are you doing about the Iranian threat? And my answer is I'm doing nothing. I really don't understand security. I really don't know what the Mossad is doing right now to save me from the Iranian threat. I tell you what I can do. What I can do is show the secular Jews a smile and show them that keeping halacha does not mean that I can't be a nice guy at the same time. That keeping every last iota of Jewish law doesn't mean that you're not a mensch. That I can do. I can fight, quote unquote, and debate with a rabbi without belittling him. That I can do. I can take responsibility for negligence if God forbid it happens. And finally, I can try to make the Torah as relevant as possible to the public thoroughfare and not just to my own little small confines. What I could do, I'll try to do. What I can't do is out of my control. And I end with this. Many, many years ago, a bunch of yeshiva guys came to the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And in Melbourne, you don't have a lack of Lubavitcher Hasidim, so you can go and authenticate the story that I heard. It was in the 50s. And they came, and he noticed they were there, and he said in a Fabrengen, in a wide Hasidic gathering where he said a lot of Torah words and they drank a lot of Lechayims, he said, thank God the Maccabees who captured the temple during the time that the, uh, that the Greeks had it, Thank God there were Hasidim and not Litvakim. Thank God they were part of the Hasidim. Why? Because a Litvak would have come in and with his brain, he would say, why bother to light the menorah? It's not even going to last for one day. Or maybe it would last for one day, but just one day. Let's forget about it. And the oil, we won't even find any pure oil. Let's not even look. But a Hasid, he said, a Hasid does what he can and then praise that God does all the rest. I don't know if he's right about the Maccabees being Hasidim, but I like what he said. I believe we have to do our part every Tisha B'Av, and hopefully God will do his part, and these days will turn into happy days much sooner than later. Thank you all for listening, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to hear. Um, I, have, I have a question. I'm thinking about um, a lot of the examples that you brought about the, the soul searching that it would be good to do on um, Tisha B'Av. A lot of them relate to the general community that, you, that you're a part of in Eretz Israel or the broader community. And um, it's, I, I'm, I'm picking up from one of the things that you mentioned is that it's very important to not... Um, to not deflect responsibility from the things that we have. So, you know, the responsibilities that we have and the problems that we see, we need to take responsibility for them. That's on the one hand. Um, on the other hand, it's not just about our, you know, individual lives as well. So what do you think is a good guidance for like doing some soul searching and not just being about, you know, me personally, but looking a bit broader, but at the same time, not saying, well, it's the leader's fault or it's another community's fault or it's somebody else. You know, how do we, how do we find the right, what, what guidelines can you offer us for like appropriate soul searching that's neither deflecting responsibility, but also not too limited? I'm gonna answer you very briefly with the following story. I think Rabbi, you may know it from our uh, great Rebbe, Rav Amital, Zechron Levracha. Uh, it could be you missed him by the time you learned in the yeshiva that we learned in, uh, but you heard stories, so you probably heard this story. I did, um, I did. I was there. I did cross over with him for a few months, Baruch Hashem. Oh, okay. So uh, he was the head of a yeshiva in Israel, for those that don't know. 
for over 40 years that both I was privileged to learn in as well as your rabbi, Rabbi Rosenberg. And uh, I believe that uh, you and Liddy began your life there together, no? Weren't you married? So me too. That was our first home in the apartments of that yeshiva. Now, he was once asked, should, how do you encourage your own children to learn with you, to learn Torah with you? Assuming that Torah learning is important and assuming that you can't be a good Jew without it, how do you get your own kids to learn with you? And his answer was very telling to me. He said, I never told my kids to learn with me, ever. They saw me learning and they wanted to join. That's what I believe is the answer to your question. How do we fix what's happening in our communities and not yet limit it just to ourselves, but rather look at the public thoroughfare, not deflect responsibility on the one hand, but on the other hand, not just say, I'm okay, let the whole world do what they're doing. The answer is you have to be first and foremost an upright individual and Jew. And number two, don't keep it private. Don't leave it to yourself. Mention it to other people by either inviting people over to see a beauty of a Shabbos table, by going ahead and making yourself available to the more broader community out there. And there's many examples of this. I can give you just one that I've totally accepted upon myself. I refuse to sit down on a plane without saying hello to the person next to me. Now, I know that's a vanishing buffalo today. When you go on a plane once upon a time, there was nothing to do. There was no internet, there was no movies, there was maybe one movie and we didn't like it. And therefore you had to talk to the person next to you. Today, everyone has personal screens. So for the last 10 years, there was like an hello at the beginning of the flight and a goodbye at the end of the flight and that was it. Today, after COVID with masks, no one says not hello and not goodbye. I go against the trend. I refuse to sit down without saying hello to the person next to me. And I can promise you on many El Al flights with many secular Israelis that hate religious people with a passion, that's not very easy to do. But I do it and all in all, it's been fine. And when I do something religious on the plane, be it get up to Davin, be it uh, get up to wash, I always mention it to the person next to me, not I'm getting up to wash, you better come with me or you're gonna die, no. I say, excuse me, I'm about to eat bread. I have to wash my hands ritually. I'll be right back. Do you mind if you can move, please? So I don't keep it to myself. On the other hand, I don't force others. I like and I believe that the best way to inspire and influence Jews is by personal example. And I'll just give you one proof for what I say. We all read on Yom Kippur at Mincha, the story of Jonah, and the whale. At the beginning of that story, when he's on that boat and the boat is about to sink in that terrible storm, they all look for the person that's responsible for God's wrath. And Yonah says, it's because of me. I didn't listen to God, throw me overboard. All your problems will be solved. Says the brisker of, no, Rav Soloveitchik, who I'm sure you mentioned many times, his uncle, he said, Yonah, could have very easily said it's because of the idol worshipers on board. And there were many. He could have said it's because of the non-Jews and there are many. But what did he do? He took responsibility and said, it's because of me. Everyone's a sinner, that's fine. Let's start with myself. Let me look in the mirror. I believe that the only way to influence the wider community is by example. And the example is gonna start not by looking at the window and saying he's no good and he's no good and she's no good. Look in the mirror and try by example. Any other questions, please, yeah, with thank pleasure. Thank you very much. For me, it's 2.30 in the afternoon, so I'm wide awake. For you, it's 9.30 at night. I'm sure you're much more tired than me. Can I just say something quickly? Um, I missed the yes. beginning. I missed the beginning. I'm sorry, but um, can you give an uh, an inspiring example of of uh, how you've um, had an impact on um, on in Sohar with uh, not, not uh, secular Jews? Sure. Um, 
I believe that uh, the best example I can give you is when we do weddings. When we do weddings, usually what happens in Israel is you have to get married Jewishly because that's the law. And you go into a very bureaucratic office and at best someone greets you, not with a smile, takes your paperwork, writes down what's needed, assigns a rabbi to you, tells you what kala classes you need to do prior to your wedding, and that's it. It's a total technical experience. At worst, it's even worse than that. You have someone that not only doesn't have a smile on, but actually makes life very difficult for you. Says you're missing this paper, you're making missing that paper, come back tomorrow, there's no way to send it by email, even though we all know there are emails. Don't be in touch with me by cell phone because my cell phone's off limits. Not to mention the fact that the college teachers come along and say to these young brides, if you don't keep the laws of family purity, you're going to die of cancer. And by the way, that was just on Israeli TV a few months ago. And finally, you get to your wedding day. You get a rabbi that comes to the wedding and the rabbi comes hopefully on time, usually not, never met you before. At best, just says the words under the chuppah, the brachot and leaves. At worst, he says some dirty jokes that are totally inappropriate. And let's just say that an in, an opportunity to influence the secular population was lost. What we do at SOAR is, first of all, when you come to register for marriage, the offices are not only open, the internet site is open. And if you fill in a form on the internet site, someone will get back to you within a day or two. Number two, you'll get a cell phone, a WhatsApp number of a lady who's in charge of your case. And she'll coordinate the rabbi, she'll coordinate the kala teacher, she'll tell you what documents are missing, you don't have to break your head on it, and you can always contact her. She has a business WhatsApp number. Number three, the kala teachers are trained by us to talk to the secular population about married life, about Jewish life, and not, God forbid, with fear and with coercion, but with influence and inspiration. And finally, the rabbis. And I'm one of the rabbis, so I'll tell you the three conditions I have to obligate myself to. Number one, I have to meet the couple prior to the wedding. Now, you may be looking at me and saying, wow, what, rocket science over here? Of course you meet the couple before the wedding. Most Israeli rabbis don't. They come to the wedding under the chuppah, do the brachot and leave. Number two, I have to show up to the wedding on time. Again, not rocket science, but in Israel, because rabbis take money for weddings, they do two, three weddings a night. It's a good business and they always come late. And number three, I don't take a penny for my services. You want to give donations to in organizations, that's your business. Transportation to the wedding, transportation home, I don't take a penny for what I do. And I can promise you, all we do, if I can sum it up, is show that Judaism is also a religion with a smile that respects, respects you, respects your spouse. And we follow every last iota of the chief rabbinate. Whatever they ask, we do. We just do it with a smile and with professionalism. That's one of the many examples of what we do at Sohar. When a secular couple, by the way, against their will, has to come and register for marriage. They come in with a lot of preconceptions in their minds. And thank God, when they come in, they meet people with smiles, with respect, going out of their way for them. Believe me, at the end of it, and I can tell you this from my own experience, I get calls, can you also marry my friend, my friend, my sister, my this or my that. You, in a word, we like to show that Judaism can be beautiful, not just horrific and scary. I'll just give you a, a small story that happened a few days ago. I married a couple and uh, I'm in touch with them. And they said, if you would have asked me before I came into the Tsohar offices to draw a picture of a rabbi, what a rabbi looks like, I would have someone with very, very big glasses, with a big belly, obviously, always overweight, his shirt sticking out, never looks, uh, you know, never looks uh, right externally, and never smiles. And I thought that was the best and wonderful, most wonderful, wonderful compliment we ever had. Namely, that 
And I quote, we learned that rabbis can smile as well. And that from our perspective, Judaism has a smile. So I hope I answered your question just a little bit. Um, thank you so much. And um, thank you to everybody for attending. And I've just posted into the chat a, uh, a link to donate to Tzohar, which is, um, this is uh, Rav Yishua didn't did not ask us to uh, to post this for the for the community, but um, Sohar is doing a, amazing work in uh, in Israel, and um, you can get a Australia. I think you froze, you froze, Marcus. Oh, okay, I thought it was me. Okay, the oh. rabbi just froze. <laughs> he just froze. Anyway. Oops. It how, do, how do people know about, how do people know about Sohar? Is like well known? Do people In know Israel, about we're very, very well known in the secular population. I like to say we're the rab we're the shul they don't go to. In other words, uh, if they're not going to Cyprus to get married civilly, then they're coming to Tsohar to register for marriage and whatnot. We're extremely well known in the secular population, not to mention that uh, our detractors know of us. So we're known even in the religious population. And of course, we have a lot of supporters around the world as well. But uh, from this perspective, we have a website, we have Facebook, we're on Instagram. We're in all the various places that uh, the secular people today are. And we try as much as possible to say, this is open to you. If you want to say no to Judaism, that's your prerogative. Just know what you're saying no to. Fantastic. And whatever you do, don't judge Judaism by what comes on TV. There's an old joke in Israel that at the beginning of the news in the evening, you have news in the evening in Australia? Yeah. Around six, seven, eight o'clock in the evening. So the evening news is here, starts at eight. Every channel starts with the words, good evening. By the end of the hour, they prove to you why it's not a good evening. And quite frankly, every time they saw religious people is always because of a scandal, not because of anything good. So uh, from this perspective. Uh-oh. Marcus, you were frozen. Are you all right now? Yeah, I think that's, um, are you sure, have we lost you there? <laughs> well, I'm glad that uh, it took till the end of this year for the uh, tech issues to uh, kick in. But anyway, um, I'm going to say, uh, that was, uh, I found that a very interesting year. I hope everybody else did. To be honest, um, I was um, I was very I was very impressed that we were able to speak about the keynotes, but actually not speak about something ancient, but speak about something very much, uh, you know, as a springboard to discuss opportunities for improvement. And I, I know I've got a lot of um, thinking to do about about uh, soul searching that I can make and um, improvements that I can make. So um, thank you very much, everybody, for attending. And um, Hamayan has a very good, uh, very thought-provoking and meaningful program for Tisha B'Av. And um, if we have to ce celebrate Tisha B'Av, I would uh, recommend that um, you join us at Hamayan. Of Yeshua. Um, I'm sorry, glad, there glad was, was a problem here with the internet. My apologies. <laughs> no worries. So I just want to say thank you to you, Rav Yeshua. We really, really appreciate you sharing your insights and. Um, most importantly, the um, the encouragement to look to look within, and to do what we need to do to um, to try and improve to make us worthy of uh, of not not having to celebrate Tisha B'Av as well. Thank you so much. A pleasure to be with you. A pleasure to see you both, Rabbi Rosenberg and Rabbi Sam Liddy, and uh, looking forward to staying in touch. Very good. Thank you. All right. Have a Wishing have a good afternoon good and a good night. Good night. Take care, everyone.
Be happy to be in touch. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.